Pastor Kev said, we launch a new series today called Everyone Plays. And over the coming weeks, we are really going to explore some of the heart of what um, was just shared in the video then and just um, look at what happens when we serve. You know, look at what happens when we serve together and the impact that that has on not just ourselves, but on the people around us. So this morning, I get to kick it off. And we're going to explore the topic of greatness this morning. And we've titled uh, this morning's message, The Mystery of Greatness. What is greatness? Well, it depends on who you ask, I think. But the dictionary defines it. Wait for it. I was amazed when I read this. The, the dictionary defines greatness as the quality of being great. <laughs> really just helps you understand about it, doesn't it? Um, it's basically, it's distinction. Uh, you could call it uh, eminence or noteworthiness. Sometimes people say that it's fame or it's an acknowledged um, superiority in a, in a particular sphere. But here at our church, um, you know that we have a bunch of family values and one of our family values is that we are counterculture. So what I want to do this morning is unpack greatness uh, with an eternal lens. We're going to look at greatness and see how Jesus defines it. There's two facets of greatness that I want to unpack this morning. Firstly, I want us to see that greatness is achieved through sifting. And secondly, we're going to see that greatness is determined through serving. So we're going to dive straight into it. If you're taking notes this morning, you can pop down our first um, point, which is that greatness is only achieved through sifting. When you make the decision to give your life to Christ and to follow him, and you begin walking this pathway of holiness and surrendering and dying to self you know, every single day, you experience the highest highs that you will ever experience in life. But alongside those highs, there are going to be some lows. There are going to be um, disappointments and hardships. There's going to be pain, trials. And as much as you know, we would like to pray a prayer and start following Jesus and then just think that our life is all going to be rainbows and sunflowers, it's just that it's not life. You know, even Jesus himself says in this world, you will have trouble. But then the promise that we hold on to is the next part, isn't it? You know, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Life with its ups and its downs is a sifting process. And when we choose to step in, when we choose to lean into Christ, surrender afresh in the times of testing, you know, surrender afresh in, in the hard times and in the valleys and in the midst of pain, it's then that we find that our dependence on God grows. It's in those moments that we find that our faith becomes even more solid. It's in the midst of those times that we discover that it's the joy of the Lord that is our strength. Sifting is a process that takes you through to greatness. Greatness as heaven defines it. Through sifting, our faith is, it's refined. You know, and it's this process of choosing to surrender and allowing the Holy Spirit to chip away at us and chip away the little bits of self and me so that we become more and more like the image of Christ. When we're like Christ, when we, so before we know Christ, we're like a, a rough, uncut diamond. And I've got a picture up for you this morning because maybe you haven't seen one. We're all familiar with the sparklers that you get when you get engaged. Katie, I'm sure yours is nice and shiny still. But this is a rough, uncut diamond. And despite what it looks like, there is exponential value inside those stones. And a designer begins the process of getting that diamond out. And he cuts it. And he polishes it and he grinds it and then he cuts it and he polishes it and he grinds it and the process goes on and on and eventually through the process the designer reveals that what was rough is now a beautiful diamond. To get the value out there has to be a process and in our lives that process could be called sifting. 
See, our world and our circumstances and the decisions that we've made, maybe even the decisions that other people have made that affect us, um, you know, maybe the stuff that's happened to us along the way, the way we've reacted to things, all of this has shaped us and left us like an uncut and rough diamond. But then we meet Jesus and we choose to surrender and we begin this lifelong process, like Talia mentioned on the video before, a daily process of surrendering our life to Christ, of being sifted into greatness. And the potential that's in us, he begins to mine that out. And so he starts to help us deal with our past. And we can do courses like Emotionally Healthy Spirituality and deal with the 90% of the stuff that people don't even see. And we recognize that sometimes we've got to go back in order to go forward. And he begins to mine that greatness out of us. And then we spend time in the Word. You know, we soap out our devotions every single day, not only reading the Word, but being obedient to it, applying it to our lives. And slowly the Holy Spirit, he just keeps shaping us into the image of Christ. And our faith begins to grow. And we realize that we have a lot to learn, a lot to learn. And along the way, as a, as a follower of Jesus, as a servant, we discover that there's a few things that we have to learn to be great at. I don't know about you, but we have to learn to be great in patience. We have to learn to be great at endurance. We have to learn to be great at perseverance and self-control and, and in being real and transparent and honest. We have to learn to be great at forgiving. We have to be great at asking for forgiveness. It's a lot of character qualities. And all the while, as we're walking on this path of life in amongst the greatest heights and then the real low lows, God is bringing us to greatness in these things through the sifting process, like that uncut diamond when it's processed and it becomes a diamond. Jesus said in Luke 22, verses 31 to 32, he says this, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. You know, when life happens and the hard stuff hits us, sometimes you can kind of feel like the wind has been knocked out of you. But the beautiful thing is that faith is there. Faith remains, and faith is the thing that God builds on, and then builds on, and then builds on again. I want to have a little bit of interaction this morning because I want us to see that all of us are in this process called sifting. So I'm going to ask you to stand up this morning if you have experienced sifting in your life. Now that sifting could look like a no to a prayer that you really, really wanted answered yes, or maybe it was a not yet to a uh, prayer that you prayed. Uh, maybe it was a tragedy that you've had along the way, suffering. I'm, you can stand right now. I'm, I'm honestly expecting to see everybody stand. You know, maybe like me, you've had a little woe is me moment when you're uh, walking through one of those deep valleys. Maybe there's just pain that you've experienced when the Holy Spirit is chipping away at the little bits of self that he wants removed so that he is more visible. Look around, and for those of you that are watching us online, you might not be able to see, but basically, we're all standing. You know, it, this is life. This is life, and all of us are on the journey, and each and every one of us is going to experience the hills and the valleys. This is life, but you know what the promise of God is? It's that he's going to be with us. And I love what Nan shared this morning, that lyric of that song, you know, God didn't just remove the sea. He, they walked through it. I mean, he made a way. But that's the thing. He is with us and he is walking with us even in the valley. And so my prayer to you this morning and my, my, my plea, I guess, to you this morning is that you would stay with Jesus 
that even in the midst of the pain and even while your ants are waiting for the breakthrough and even while you're waiting for the answered prayer, that you would stay with Jesus, that you would lean in, that you wouldn't allow bitterness to take hold, that you wouldn't walk away, but that you would see that Jesus is right beside you and he's gonna walk you through the sea, he's gonna walk you through the valley and he's gonna lead you out to the other side. And all the while, this process of sifting is going to lead us to greatness in him. You can take your seats except for Wendy because (laughs) Wendy, um, most of you know Wendy. I'd say pretty much all of you know Wendy. (laughs) If you don't, here she is. (laughs) What you might not know is um, some of Wendy's story. And she was talking this week with Laura in at the junction just sharing a little bit about um, some of the sifting that she has gone through. And we've all just seen that each and every one of us has experienced the sifting of, of God. And um, it's often in a number of different ways. But Wendy, um, you were sharing a little bit about a particular um, sifting process that God took you through in regards to motherhood. Can you just share with us this morning, take us back to where it started? Right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, My husband and I, Cameron, we got married when we were young, 20 and 21, and decided right back then that we would wait for five years before we started a family. We thought we'd better grow up first and get this marriage thing sorted out. Grow up. Has that happened yet? No, not yet. We're still waiting for that bit. (laughs) You get old, you know, you're not doing that. So... We thought, okay, yeah, we'll wait for five years. And I was busy involved in the music team. Cam was serving upstairs in the kids' ministry. And so we just did life. And then after the five years, we're like, okay, yep, let's start seriously planning a family. So we did. And every month would come around and we'd get the little reminder that, no, we're not successful yet. We're like, okay, we'll just keep going and keep going. And then... It came two years down the track and we're like, still nothing. And when you have a passion for kids and doing that, sort of working with kids and having doing life with people like that, it's really sad when you're sort of like watching everyone else starting families and you're like, when will we get our go? So we just kept doing it and um, Christmas... (laughs) Doing life, (laughs) sorry. Oh, I'm doing a Ruth moment. <laughs> Sorry. No, we just kept serving. And... Boom. Yep. Pull the moment back. Hang on. Foot out of mouth. You kept, you kept serving. We kept serving, <laughs> and... focusing on what we were called to do. Oh, this is going south. Anyway. <laughs> And I remember, that's what I kept telling my children after all. (laughs) Anyway, so Christmas time, two years down the track, we're sort of like, yep, nothing's happening. And I remember making a conscious verbal decision that I'd I'd grown up in church and I knew all the things and I'd, that sort of stuff. But you get to a stage where you've actually got to just really do like a physical mind shift of things. I'd grown up knowing that um, God's in control. But in my world, when I was younger, you're driving, a, it was like a car. You're driving a car and you've got the steering wheel, the driver does, and then you learn when you're younger, God's in control. So then you sort of go, yep, here's the steering wheel, God. But in real life, you know, you can't do that in a car. You can't just pull the steering wheel across and give it to him. You've actually got to hop out of the driver's seat and let him in. And so I remember back then at that Christmas time going, God, you know what, if we are to have children, or if we can't have children, it's okay. Our love is big enough that we will love whoever you put in our path. And so we made that conscious effort and I stepped out of the driver's seat into the passenger seat and let God do his thing. Two months later, we fell pregnant. Miranda. So there you go. But we kept serving. Cameron, we actually 
Didn't got you, um, you stepped into even more serving when you yeah. fell pregnant? <laughs> I, was, I was pregnant, obviously, by this stage, with morning sickness 24-7, playing the piano with a sick bucket next to me. I actually never had to run off stage to the bathroom, but I let anyone know in that clear path, if I suddenly disappear, <laughs> that's where I'm going. Cameron was doing kids ministry at that time, then there was a change around and Cameron stepped up to take over kids' ministry. I decided that it was a bit too hard to play and sing and be pregnant and vomit. So I went and served with Cameron upstairs in the kids' ministry. So that's what you do when you're pregnant and you take over everything. So there you go. <laughs> Love it. Well done. This was a big deal for Wen to share this morning. I know you see her all the time up on the piano, but to come and share your story has yeah. taken courage. But I know that you guys are all encouraged by that, right? Yeah. Thanks, Wen. <laughs> and obviously the story continued. You know that she has her beautiful Miranda and her giant of a son, James, and um, James the giant. Um, I love your story as an example of the faithfulness of God and remaining faithful to God while you're waiting for the answer. And I, I love that you were able to get to a place where you could say, you know, we talk often about, you know, if God took this away from me, um, you know, I'll still, I'll still serve you and I'll still praise your name. But even if God doesn't add to you the things that you are praying for, can you still say the same? You know, that God, you are in control and that I love you and that you're worthy of my my life. So thank you, Wendy, for sharing. And um, as I look around this room and and think about some of the stories, and I don't know all of your stories, but I know parts of some of them, and I know that there is great faith. There is great faith that has been built in your lives as God has taken you through sifting. <coughs> stories not like Wendy's necessarily but stories nonetheless of the sifting of God and the greatness that he is drawing out of you. And um, Michael, um, Kev shared this week about these guys getting interviewed and what they didn't air on the final um, newsreel, which I wish they did, was this beautiful moment where Tiff actually shared um, that in, in the midst of, of losing literally every physical possession that she has, she has experienced this deep peace and that she's walking in this deep peace. And that's, that is greatness. That is the result of being sifted, you know, to get to a place where there is great faith that is built and there is great peace that passes all understanding that we can walk in and that we can know regardless of the circumstances that come our way. And there is great joy, you know, a joy that becomes the very strength of our life to keep going through the valley and up the hill. You know, um, as I said before, it's my prayer that in the sifting, that you just, you wouldn't, you wouldn't walk away from Jesus, but that you would instead do the opposite, that you would lean in to him, that you would know for yourselves the incredible peace and the incredible joy and this great faith that he is building in and through you. You know, and, and so keep gathering as a family and keep opening the word of God and reading his scripture and keep applying it to your life and stepping out in faith and obedience. Keep doing those things so that in you too, this deposit of faith that has been placed within us would grow and would become the foundation for what we have up ahead. Keep rejoicing and keep praising. It's easy to exercise faith in God when everything is going well. It gets a little bit harder when the times get tough, even in the sifting. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the book of Habakkuk, but there's a beautiful portion of scripture in this book. And you see him um, in this particular chapter move from a place of, like, of doubting God to a place of trusting God no matter what. And it says, and I think I've got it up on the screen for you. Uh, it's chapter three, verses 17 to 19. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet 
I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. In the midst of sifting, God will hold you up. He is your strength. And in him, you find reason to hope and to have joy. He is the Lord. And like Habakkuk, even if you have got no visible hope for the future, you know, no, no buds, if you go back, the hope for the future, that, that's represented in the buds, you know, that are, that are, they're not there, promising a crop to come. And even when the present has let you down and there are no crops in the field and there's no food there to harvest, and even if there are no reserves from the past to fall back on, so even if the barns are empty, yet you can choose to hope and to have faith and to trust in the God and to know that the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's when we discover true greatness. That is what true greatness is, to live in the joy of the Lord that is our strength. Yes, there are gonna be trials. Yes, there is gonna be pain. Yes, there is gonna be heartache and disappointment, but you know what? Rather than remove them, God is saying, let me walk with you through them so that in the sifting, you will come to greatness. So keep growing, keep walking the pathway of holiness. Keep remembering what Pastor Kev shared with us a few weeks ago about the who and the do. You know, God is more interested in who we are becoming than what we are doing. His will is that we would be holy like he is holy and his calling is that we would follow Jesus and be conformed to the image of Christ and that happens in the sifting process. So allow the Holy Spirit to keep chiseling away at you, to keep removing the parts of self and you that he doesn't want there, shaping you to be in his image and and displaying his character. Less of me, more of you. Lord, make that your prayer day by day as you follow him, even in the tough times, even in the valleys, and your faith will be great. It will be strong and it will be refined. And your peace will be great. It'll be so deep. The world won't be able to take it away. And your joy will be great. It will be unspeakable and full of life. And when you understand this process, the process of sifting, you understand the beauty of being sifted into true greatness, greatness as heaven defines it. Greatness is achieved through sifting. Secondly this morning, point number two is that greatness is determined through serving. So greatness is achieved through sifting, but greatness is also determined through serving. And I don't know about you, but as I walk through this life, I want to see things through his eyes. I have to remind myself often to look at things through the lens of eternity rather than these physical eyes that so often get caught up in the here and in the now. And I know that this world is broken. I know that you guys know that this world is broken. We see it all of the time. And you see hurt and you see sickness and you see evil and you see people that are trying desperately to get out of that brokenness. And they try a whole bunch of different things to get out of brokenness. They might try education, or they might try religion, you know, just trying to be a good person. They might try addiction. There's a whole bunch of of things that people try to, to pull themselves out of brokenness, but you can't. You can't get out of brokenness. There is only one way to get out of brokenness, and that is in a in the person of Jesus Christ. And as followers of Jesus, we have the incredible privilege of leading people to see Jesus, to see him. And each of us, we all need to to be living mission, don't we? We all need to, to live life every single day, partnering with the Holy Spirit to love God and love people and, and make disciples who make disciples. And, um, It's gonna take all of us. It's gonna take each and every one of us doing that. Um, (laughs) I was, I will go, I'll show you, because I think we need a laugh. When you look at the people in the world that are hurting and you recognize that they need Jesus, um, (laughs) no, I'm not even gonna try and explain it. I'll just show you some pictures. 
Um, have, you ever, have you ever read on the internet about the different ways that some people see Jesus? I'll, just, okay, I'll, I'll clarify that even more and say that there are different ways that people have seen the face of Jesus in physical things. Let's have a look at the first one. Um, right here, this is the face of Jesus on a Walmart receipt. A newly engaged South Carolina couple saw this after shopping for their basic essentials at Walmart. Next up is a Marmite lid. Marmite's not quite as nice as Vegemite, but this was found by Claire Allen of South Wales. She was just buttering her toast for the morning and getting some Marmite out, and she found the face of Jesus on a Marmite lid. Sarah Crane of London, she took to social media when she saw this. Oh no, not this one, have we got one more? There's a sock. That's a sock drying on her washing line. And she saw the face of Jesus in her drying sock. And last but not least, Don Taylor of Colorado, he didn't see just the face of Jesus, he actually saw the resurrected Jesus on a high voltage power pole. He said when they interviewed him that he's not a religious person, but when he saw this, it stopped him dead in his tracks. Now, don't get me wrong. Now, you can Google, and if you've got 10 minutes this afternoon, you know, it's a great way to spend 10 minutes. You can see the way that people have seen Jesus. It doesn't stop at these items. Cheese toasties, um, a fry pan, mold next to the bathroom on a little bit of, what are they, like wall. He, he has appeared everywhere. Pancakes even, Kev. Pancakes. Yeah, Jesus in pancakes. Don't get me wrong, Jesus can use <laughs> varied ways and, and different means to talk to people and to reach out to people and to get to our attention, but what I wanna say this morning is that it's a really good thing that we don't have to look to a pair of drying socks to see the face of Jesus because he's in you. <laughs> and I love what Talia said in her video this morning, you know, people are gonna see Jesus in you and in I when we go out and we love and we serve in his name. When we live out the great command to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength and out of that place of loving God, when we love our neighbours, people are going to see Jesus. And they saw it, as Pastor Kev already said this morning, as they came into the junction this week. And whether they were coming to drop their kids off at a school holiday workshop or to drop some... Um, furniture off for the brightens, you know, they saw Jesus in the way that they were greeted with a smile and that someone gave them the opportunity to sit down and have an intentional time of conversation with them. And they saw it in the way that the place was cleaned so beautifully by our volunteers that, that serve in that way. You know, they saw it as they were handed a coffee. And even this morning, you know, we are seeing Jesus in one another as we are serving one another. The kids right now are seeing Jesus in their leaders as they pour out and they serve the next generation. We don't have to look for the face of Jesus in, in objects in the world because the world have the opportunity to see Jesus in you and I. And I think that that is an incredible thing. And maybe for you this week, your workmates saw Jesus in you when you responded with grace in a conversation and instead of you know, participating in the office gossip you withheld, maybe they saw Jesus in you and maybe your boss saw Jesus in you this week as you came and you gave 110% and you served as if you were serving unto the Lord. You know, your boss had the opportunity to see Jesus in you and maybe even for the mums this week, you've got the kids home from, from school on holidays and it's been hectic but your kids have seen Jesus in you as the way that you have loved them and intentionally just poured your effort and your energy into them. The world is gonna see Jesus in us as we serve and we love in his name. Not in a veggie light, not in a veggie mite lid, but in each and every one of us. And you know, culture says that um, the greatest among us are the ones being served, but the true mystery of greatness is that Jesus has turned that on its head. And he says, in the kingdom, 
is opposite to what the world says. Jesus says that greatness comes in serving. And there's a scripture in Luke 22 in which Jesus defines true greatness through serving. And it's the Last Supper and Jesus has gathered his disciples around him and it's the last opportunity he has for like an intimate conversation with, with them before he heads to the cross. The Son of God, he has come as man and he has taken on the nature of a servant, scripture says, and he's come to take our sin and to die uh, in our place on the cross and in that moment, The disciples are bickering about who is greater. I'm like, good timing, guys. Great choice there. But he says this to his disciples and he defines greatness like this. He says, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? is, Is it not the one who is at the table, but I am among you as one who serves? This isn't the first time that Jesus has talked about servanthood. It's, it's obviously a real counterculture thought, but those that were following along and tracking with Jesus as he was teaching, like he has shared on this topic before and he's taught that the last will be first and the first will be last. And he came as a king, but he stooped to wash the feet of his disciples. You know, he says, um, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. This is the kind of leader that Jesus was. Instead of taking a seat at the head of the table, he picks up a towel and he grabs a bucket of water and he starts washing the dirt of his disciples' feet. Servant leader. And he asks us to do the same. And so when I say that someone can see Jesus in you, it's because I really believe that when we are serving, when you find a servant heart, you find the heart of Jesus. And the world might say that the greatest amongst us are the ones being served, but Jesus says, follow my example. Greatness comes in serving. And the world would say that the greatest are the ones that have everything, But Jesus would say, the kingdom of God, it's about the ones who give. And the world might say that the greatest amongst us are those that are known, celebrities, you know, ones with fame. But Jesus says, no, the greatest amongst us are the ones who make me known, the ones that would be willing to walk the path that they're on, surrendering their life each and every day and allowing their words and their actions to speak and to point people to Jesus. That's what matters. The world celebrates fame. The world celebrates those that you know, seem to have more greatness than others. And, and I find it interesting that the greater someone is, in, as the world defines it, the, the higher their level of um, the serving that they need increases. Have you ever noticed that? I was an event manager and um, for many years I would receive riders from bands or celebrities that were coming in to be a part of our events and these riders would list out um, the requirements of this person to appear at that particular event and some of them were just, some of them were kind of normal like they wanted a red carpet and they wanted a limo to arrive in and some of them wanted fancy drinks, some of them just wanted a lot of drinks, it didn't matter what kind. Some of them, um, one of them I remember, he requested a toilet seat to be replaced on the bathroom in his green room, one that no one had sat on before. We received all sorts of weird and wonderful requests, um, bowls of just the brown M&Ms. They don't come that way, by the way. You've got to buy the whole packet and someone's got to sort them out. Um, <laughs> But the world, the world might say that that's how greatness sometimes seems to be defined, you know, in fame, but that's not what it looks like in his kingdom. Jesus celebrates the servants. He doesn't determine greatness the way that the world does. Greatness is determined, determined through serving. Pastor Wayne Cadiro says that we don't graduate from serving, but we graduate to serving. 
It's the opposite of our culture. But the best leader in the kingdom of God is the one who serves. The Son of Man came not to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus, the Son of God, stepped out of the grandeur of heaven, giving his life for you and I. He came to serve. He left the wonder of heaven. If anyone should have received the service of everybody else, it was Jesus. But he came, willing to take on our sin and our suffering and our shame on that cross. He modeled for us a different kind of greatness, a kind of greatness that the world had never seen. He is the example. He is the one that we need to look at and aspire to be like. And as followers of Jesus, we need to correct back to his definition of greatness, not what the world says, but what Jesus exemplifies. He died for everyone. You know, he died for all of humanity and... In doing that, he created at least the opportunity that each and every person could surrender their life to him. He died for everyone, and I find it interesting that in my life, and maybe this is your story as well, it's easy to serve. Um, It's easy to serve when I feel like serving. And it's easy to serve when people are nice but it gets a little bit harder to serve when there's a bit of pushback or when the the people that you're dealing with are just, they're not very nice. And a lot of you are in the customer service world. Um, I remember, again, when I was working as as an event manager, having this client, and we were always told that the client comes first. The client comes first. And so this particular client was just hard work and everything was not quite good enough and the banner that they'd ordered in was the wrong size and that was my fault and the periwinkle blue centerpieces that they'd ordered from another supplier were not quite the right shade of periwinkle blue and that was my fault and the piano was two inches too far to the right and it should have been a little bit more to the left and it was just thing after thing after thing and and not just like and just really getting cut down by her and I remember just having to tell myself like just keep showing up, just keep smiling, just keep serving, the customer comes first. And I thought, oh, when I started working at the church, it's not gonna be like that at all. But do you know what? In pastoral work, it's hard sometimes. Sometimes we get phone calls or text messages that are just, they just hurt. But the reality is that hurt people hurt. And You know, there are times where I've wanted to either just hang up. I know you can't believe it, but it's true. I've either wanted to just hang up on that person or when I do hang up, I just want to cry. But it's in those moments that the true heart of a servant is revealed because it's not always easy to serve, but the true test of a servant is how you respond when you are actually treated like one. And... um, our natural inclination can be to pull back. But I would say we are called to serve and we are not not just called to serve when it's easy and when the people around us are kind and nice. Like Jesus came to serve the entire world, we are called to serve the people on our path and the greatest test of a servant is how he responds when he is treated like one. People can take out on you what's happening in them, but don't allow that to stop you from serving and giving your best, because we are not just serving, you know, as Ruth or as Pastor Kev or as Kirsten, we are actually serving as a servant of Jesus Christ. And maybe just in that moment of being treated like a servant, they are actually going to be pointed to Jesus. Can I ask this morning, those that are distributing the bread and the juice for communion, just to begin doing that. And I just wanted to encourage you with that thought as we close because God loves the people that are in your world. He loves the people that are in your workplace. He loves the people that are uh, at university with you at school. He loves the people that are in the club that you're a part of and in your home. And he has positioned you, each and every one of us, right there, right where you're needed 
to be a channel of his love as we serve the people in his world so that they might see, you know, in your hands and feet, they might see his and that they might see his face as you point them to him. But it's got to be less of me. It's got to be less of me and more of him. We have to die so that it's Jesus that they see in us. And in Galatians 2.20, it's a verse that we're all familiar with. It says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Remember the old song? I bet Phil would. Um, <laughs> not that you're old. <laughs> I just realized that didn't come across. I'm sure a whole lot of you remember it. Um, it's no longer I that liveth. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. He lives, he lives, Jesus is alive in me. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. You know what, that song, um, it often comes to mind when I'm in a situation where I think I can feel myself pulling back and I just remember the truth of that song and you can sing it in a bit of like a cowboy kind of, you know. Um, Because I want you to think about this. If we show up into a situation with our attitude and I show up with my pride and if I show up with my issues, myself, all people are going to get a taste of is me. And that is no good. Ruth is not going to change anyone. But if I am willing to die to self, if I am willing to remember that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, then the people in my world have the opportunity to see Jesus. They have the opportunity to see His face. We become the salt. We become the flavour. We become the light that points people to Christ. Jesus shows up when we empty ourselves of ourself. And even when you are treated like a servant, thank you, Len, they are gonna see Jesus in you in that process. It is no longer I that lives, but Christ who lives in me. Jesus loves people so much and He wants them to see Him. Let's make it so that they do. Let's each and every one of us make a commitment every day, every hour, every moment if we need to, to die to self, to empty us of self and allow ourselves through the sifting to be shaped and modelled into the likeness of Jesus so that when we show up in a situation, people are gonna see Jesus. And I know that that can be hard. And I know that some of you are dealing with big stuff at the moment. And I know that, you know, you add to that the reality of the valley that you are perhaps walking through. You add to that the challenge of your workplace. You add to that customers and colleagues and and cultures within workplaces sometimes that just make it really, really difficult. And, and the last thing you can sometimes feel like doing is showing up as a servant. But when you show up and when you serve the people in your world, whether it be your workplace, whether it be your community, whether it be your home, whether it be right here at our church where everyone plays, then we all have the opportunity to see Jesus. When you come and you serve others inspired by Jesus, you are working unto the Lord. And in that, you are stepping into greatness. So we pick up a towel and we take the servant's entrance and we serve as we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And as we take these elements now, you know, the bread represents His body that was broken for us and the cup of juice represents His blood that He freely shed for each and every one of us. 
And in this moment, we, we gratefully remember the tremendous sacrifice that Jesus offered for each and every one of us so that through the power of His blood, we would know forgiveness and we would know freedom. And then we choose every day to walk into that. Jesus is the example. He is the example in all of life in what it means to be a servant leader. Philippians 2 makes it clear that even though Jesus is God, that He made Himself nothing taking on the very nature of a servant and being found in appearance a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. That is the true definition of greatness. That is the true definition of love. And that is the very thing that we need to keep modeling our lives after and keep correcting back to. So this morning as we take communion together, pause and think about the greatness and the graciousness of our God. Think about the example of Jesus, how He modelled for us what it looks like to pick up a towel and to serve. Let's take the bread and the cup this morning. Lord, I thank you for your grace. God, I thank you that there is nothing that we could have done. There is nothing that we could possibly do to deserve it. But God, we thank you for it. We never want to take it for granted in our lives, Lord God. We thank you for your presence. We thank you that you are with us, that you never leave us, even through the valleys and even through the sifting process. Even when it's painful, even when life hurts, God, we know that you are with us and we know that in you we find true peace and incredible joy. And so God, this morning again, we just offer our lives afresh to you in the same way that you served us. God, may we pick up a towel and may we serve the people that are on the path that you have us walking so that they might see you in us. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.